I had seen them do things like treat people like cogs in a wheel, like disposable assets on a balance sheet. And then realizing in this very moment that they were, they were just worried about their own image. And that didn't land with me, especially in an industry where we care for people's lives. I decided in that moment to basically get up and walk out of that boardroom and decided that my move was to, to leave the room, to change the room. I've got a great conversation for you. It's with Tony Martinetti. He is the Chief Inspiration Officer at Inspired Purpose Partners. Say that 10 times. He's a fantastic guy. We talk about his experience of burnout as executive, as an executive at a biotech firm and his subsequent reinvention as a coach, advisor, facilitator. He has this fantastic idea of the campfire within the office, how that works and can create connection with people. We also talk about the idea of thinking of ourselves as organizations that require regular disruption. How do I disrupt myself to stay relevant and to stay agile? And lastly, he talks about, which I love, this idea of a third space. We have our workspace, our home space, but are we creating for ourselves a third space for reflection, for the opportunity to try on new things? It's a brilliant conversation, very inspiring. Let's dive in. And we are live with another episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I'm here with Tony Martinetti. He is the host of the virtual Campfire podcast. He's the author of this book, which I've read. It's called uh, Campfire Lessons for Leaders, uh, which has some fantastic stories in it. He's also the author of Climbing the Right Mountain. He's a coach, facilitator, advisor. and the chief inspiration officer, what a title, of Inspired Purpose Partners, uh, Tony, a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. And, you know, what a lovely introduction. I appreciate the, uh, the intro. So thank you so no, much. My pleasure. As, as with all my guests, I, I really like to, to wind it all the way back before we get into all of the insight and wisdom that you've got to uh, offer. Tony, where, where did your story start? Where did, you, where did you grow up? What were the formative influences uh, that shaped who you are today? Which is uh, very um, relevant, yeah. considering the fact that the subtitle of your book, Campfire Lessons for Leaders, is How Uncovering Our Past Can Propel Us Forward. Yeah. So yeah, I love it. I mean, you know, taking that stance is important. So, so I'll start with once upon a time. No, okay, uh, no, I, I would start with uh, you know, as a child, I was known for you know being the artist, uh, you know, this person who did a lot of drawing and painting and all of that. And you know, one of the things about that which is interesting, and that's why I go that far back, is that um, I, I always thought that was what I was going to be, an artist, you know, a person who would potentially be an architect or something to that effect. And um, what was interesting is along the way, um, the adults in my life ended up saying like, oh, even though you're really good, you know, maybe you should think about something that's going to make you money. (laughs) So I think a lot of people face that um, at some point in their lives, like, okay, it's time to get real and um, get a grown up job. And um, I decided to switch into pre-med when I went into college. And um, switch from so what you were you on an artistic track then before you got into oh, pre med advanced placement art you know really doing all these amazing things and you know really doing well at it um, but the reality is that you know I decided based on listening to the voices that we often do we listen to right. people we trust people that we admire and just well meaning adults that try to help us find our path and so. You know, I decided to go down this path of science and, you know, becoming a doctor was the thing that, um, that I was aspiring to next. And, you know, there's not completely unfounded and I did enjoy science. So <clears throat> I went down into, um, you know, pre-med, um, but quickly realized that that wasn't for me. Um, 
it wasn't what I was meant for. And so switched into business, which was the next evolution. And then found myself working for a number of years, working in um, tech and then biotech. So I get a chance to really marry up two parts of who I am. Um, the, the science part, you know, working in biotech, but particularly working in the business side of the of, um, of that business. So working in finance and strategy roles within the role, you know, within that industry. And I spent 25 years working in that industry and it was wonderful. I mean, just fantastic, you know, great to see the impact of patients on patients. And ironically enough, today is, is rare disease today, day, um, which is a day where we celebrate the impact that um, we've had on rare diseases. Um, you know, there's 7,000 rare diseases in the world. And so um, I worked for one of the companies that was at the forefront of, of making an impact on rare diseases. So it was really cool to be part of that. But when were there any particular rare diseases that stand out that you had a hand in creating a um, medication for? Yeah, I worked on a few different ones. One in particular that comes to mind is uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, I worked on uh, one of the earliest game-changing therapies for cystic fibrosis. When you think about the, the cost of treating CF, um, it's astronomical and it's a lifetime uh, of, of, of you know, nebulizers and you know, chest comp compressions and things like that. And now there's a therapy that helps people to manage and actually live into a, to adulthood, which was not something that we ever thought was possible. Um, and, you know, to the point where people who, had, who were diagnosed with CF didn't even know, like, how to plan for a life of getting married or planning for their future because they never thought they would, they would have their children or themselves um, live that. Right. So, wow. Um, yeah. Something and, and to celebrate. Yeah. yeah. And, and were you on the, the scientific side of that? Were you like in the lab developing the, the, the compounds or whatever it worked? No, I was on the business side. And so what I did, particularly one of the things I did on the C, uh, for CF is I actually developed a program to ensure that every patient had the opportunity to get access to therapy um, if, right. if they couldn't afford it, because it's very expensive. There's no doubt about it. And mm -hmm. it's not delicious. The, these drugs are expensive because they're, it takes a lot of effort to get yeah. to that stage where they're available to the public. And so, um, you know, the key thing is to make sure that um, every patient, whether they're, you know, they don't have um, insurance or they're underinsured, that they have access to therapy no matter what. So, Right. Great. Yeah. yeah that's a. Uh... Yeah, because that's honestly because coming from the UK, we have our NHS. It's it's always interesting to hear the stories out of the states of, of people who just can't get treatment in a way that hundred percent that wouldn't happen right in the UK. Yeah. So I mean, I, I'll fast forward just a little bit to say yeah. it was a great journey. Uh, it had its ups and downs. I mean, I saw some amazing um, leadership, um, learned some great lessons, and had some great experiences. But I also saw some of the you know not so great leadership. Um, and also realized that along the way, people would say to me, like, yeah, there's something different about you. You're not a typical finance person. I'm like, okay, well, what is that? What does it mean to be typical anything? I don't want to be typical. But um, at the same time, this is the path I'm on and I'll continue to pursue it. Um, until I started to see myself burning out in the process of, of doing the work and working harder and trying to prove myself in this field. And then realizing that this is not who I am. <clears throat> uh, there was some truth in, the, in what people were telling me. And so I finally had a moment where, you know, after getting some like, darker moments of burnout and, and depression, um, I started and, to and, see. And how was that to sink into burnout and depression? Did, like, describe that for me. I'm, I'm <laughs> interested. Mm. Sorry, I got a frog in my throat here. <laughs> um, the... Um, it was tough. I mean, it was this moment of like losing, and I'll, I'll say this is what happens. It's, it becomes a pattern. You know, you get stuck in these patterns of like, okay, you know, this is what I do. Keep on moving, 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 moving. And then all of a sudden um, you arrive at this moment and saying like, what, what happened? What, how did I get here? Um, and being in that state where you've, you know, realized you haven't taken vacation. You don't do, when you do go on vacation, you're working, 
And um, it's just the doing mode. And I, I often say I was addicted to doing and not being. I didn't get into that space, that space of, of enjoying life. I was just going through it. Um, right. So uh, that feeling was not good. It felt like, you know, to come back to the idea of the artist, um, the color of my life had kind of slipped away and it was more of a gray drab. And I didn't have a lot that I was looking forward to. Um, and I wanted to bring that spark back. I wanted the color to come back because what else am I living for? Yeah. Yeah. So that was the experience was a sense of like, I lost purpose in my life. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting. And I heard, uh, I read an article recently about somebody redefining burnout and including this condition, which you described where it's not like you're just on the couch and you can't move and you're, you're too stressed at it. You're, you're just going and going and going and you can't switch off. Uh, and so it sounds like that. What you, you, for you, it wasn't the experience of just sitting on the couch and not being able to do anything. It was just, just the color going and, and just, you were just on autopilot and it yeah. can stop. Is that right? Yeah. And, and, and also, um, there's a part of this, which some experience, which is a sense of re resentment for other people. Like, um, you know, you start to look at other people's lives and say like, oh my gosh, like, you know, how are they so lucky and how do they, you know, have to this like, you know, ease of life. And the reality is you created the situation you're in, you know, and we can't look at other people and compare. We have to think about how am I complicit in creating the situation that I'm in? And right. um, that's where the journey within is important. Um, unfortunately, we sometimes don't do that. And we don't really spend the time until it's gotten maybe dire, you know, or, or dark to the dark moment. Um, yeah. And some of us need that uh, wake up moment to, to really start to build and, and rebuild our experience. Yeah. And so was there one like pivotal moment was that where, where something clicked and you realized you needed to do something different with? Yeah. I mean, I say, um, there was uh, a buildup and then all of a sudden it, it happened. Um, so the buildup was that, you know, obviously I had my dark moments and, um, I started to see that there was more I wanted to live for. And so I started to, to do some work to figure out, you know, what can I do differently that would potentially create different results. But I was still still living in the environment um, that um, that created that um, that darkness, if you will. Right. Uh, so it's hard, you know. It's people say like, if you want to change your life, change your environment. I think that's true. Um, but you could start by becoming aware of the fact that what is creating that. And so um, what led up to the ultimate moment that I decided to change was, you know, sitting in a biotech boardroom and realizing that I was looking around the room and having that awareness that things weren't, you know, they weren't great for me and they weren't great the way the leaders were leading this company. And I had seen them do things like treat people like cogs in a wheel, like disposable assets on a, you know, on a board, um, on a balance sheet. And then realizing in this very moment that they were, they were just worried about their own image. And that didn't land with me, especially in an industry where we care for people's lives. We have to make sure we're taking care of the people's lives who make this happen. And I decided in that moment to basically get up and walk out of that boardroom and decided that my move was to, to leave the room, to change the room in some way um, without a plan. But I knew that that did you literally like walk out of the meeting or was yeah. did you wait until it? you did? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I was the one who felt the felt it the most. It wasn't like everyone was like a gasp and like, oh, <laughs> it wasn't a gasping moment. I think it was mostly people thought maybe I was going to the bathroom or something to that effect. But right, I didn't come back. Wow, right, mm. yeah. And, so. and just to illustrate for people, I'm interested, you, you talked about, you know, some of the behaviors of the leadership, pe pe treating people like resources. Like, is, is there a, like a specific example that illustrates that way of leading? Yeah. I mean, there was a few conversations I, you know, been privy to and had seen where, you know, the CEO would say things like, oh, you know, um, 
you know, there's, there's some grumbling about, you know, people in this particular department not being happy and, you know, they're, um, they want this and they're looking for this. And, um, and he said to the effect of who cares, you know, we'll just replace them. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that didn't land well, you know, you know, hearing that coming from the CEO, which is to say, you know, granted, you know, sure, people are, are always moving in and out of organizations, but let's be a little bit more respectful and honor and, uh, and honor that people give up their, their time, their lives to be there. And yeah. they care for the purpose and, and they, they look to leadership for meaning in the work. And um, for a CEO to say something like that is um, no matter who's in the room, that doesn't bode well. Right. Yeah. And it was a series of incidents like this that eventually had you yeah. leave the meeting. Yeah. And not just one. I mean, this is not the only leader like that. I mean, I've seen a lot right. of leaders. And as I left the room, I started to have conversations like this where I was talking to colleagues who I'd who I'd gotten to know through the years and try to, you know, express to them, Hey, I'm thinking about a different path for myself. And, you know, what is your experience? Tell me about your journey um, in this industry. And a lot of them said like, yeah, um, my boss is like that too. And honestly, the only reason why I stick around is because if I leave, I'll leave a lot of money at the table. Right. Yeah. People, people get sucked, well, trapped in a way, right? Trapped by high yeah. salaries often. And yeah. Um, and also it's true, and certainly my experience working in organizations, that, that the, whatever the state of being of the, of especially the CEO, the most senior leader, that, that ripples through the whole, the whole culture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what was, so then, so then you're like, you're free. <laughs> yeah, What's free, uh, <laughs> free is a relative word, right? Because, you know, now I have this freedom, but then what do you do with freedom, right? You know, you have to figure out what you do with this beautiful life that you have in front of you. Um, and so the first thing I started to think about is after I got over the shock and panic of like, what am I, what did I do? Um, I started to explore, well, what do I want my life to be representative of? And in how can I be true to who I am? Who am I? And so right. I think that was the, these questions I started to have was uh, kind of the cornerstone of what I wanted to build, which is, you know, my tagline in my business is inspired uh, inspiration through honest conversations. But I think the first honest conversation is that you, one you have with yourself is figuring yeah. out who, who do I want to be? What do I want to represent? And um, what I realized is that I wanted to be able to help others to connect with their most inspired purpose and the leadership style that resonates with them most deeply, not copying other people, not trying to be something that's, that's outside of themselves, but to really understand themselves at a deep level so that they can then, um, create a connection with the people around them that is real and authentic. Right. Right. And as you did that, that work on yourself, what, what were the answers? Who, who did you want to be? What did you want to stand for? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I realized is that I wanted to be a, a guide for people who to uncover what I call the brilliance within this, yeah. you know, the person who's inside the, you know, to talk in artist terms, you know, I think everyone has this brilliant um, piece of masterpiece that's inside of them. that's dying to get out. The problem is that we have lost the tools to unearth it. And so... Right. I try to give them the tools, the paintbrushes and the, you know, the, um, the creative tools to unearth that masterpiece. And, um, I think once we start to, to give them that opportunity, they start to see, wow, I have more to me than I thought. And one of the things that was reflected back to me as I started to do the work of a coach and an advisor to these people is that they said, wow, I've never felt so expansive. Um, to see so many possibilities, see so many ways that I could uh, express myself. And it's not about leaving work, leaving my job and like, you know, burning the bridges and moving on like you did. <laughs> but um, maybe it's about reconnecting with why I do what I do and, and doing it in a different way that actually creates a, a, a bigger impact. And I don't have to burn myself out in the process of doing that, which is really cool. 
Yeah. Right. And and then where does this idea of climbing the right mountain? Yeah. Because that's that's a doing metaphor, right? That's like achieving something. And we've just spoken about being. So how does this yeah marry together? Well, I think you're you know, you're you're not hundred percent right on this because you say that, but in reality, climbing the right mountain is is a being um aspect too. Um, okay. So the metaphor of climbing the right mountain, um, you know, what it came down to, and the reason why I wrote the book about this is that this sense of, you know, we do often climb a mountain and get to the top and realize, wait, this is not what I wanted or, you know, what I expected. And it, the reason why is because sometimes we subscribe to an external view of what success looks like. We don't define success on our own terms. And, um, so it, it is about reframing our view of success, not wanting to, you know, wait and postpone uh, our feeling of fulfillment to some future date, but finding fulfillment in the journey of who we are being mm. on the journey, not the doing of the work and, and, and expecting a result at the end, but more about being the person we want to be along the way and finding fulfillment in it. Um, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's Beautifully put, yeah, finding fulfillment in who you're being, right? That's um, exactly, yeah, there's an art to that. So, yeah, unpack that a bit because, because I think, well, certainly I fall into like thinking about fulfillment as having achieved the goal. But, yeah, how, how, how do you help people orientate into that state of finding fulfillment simply in being? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost is really understanding, you know, who it is that you, um, You've, you're striving to be who it is that you are. And that comes from a little bit of exploration, you know, understanding what is the journey that brought you to where you are today, you know, looking into the past and saying, you know, what are the things that you've accumulated that, that got you on this path? Um, have I lost focus of who I am, who I am? Um, and then looking into the future and saying, like, if I look into the future, what is the vision I have for myself? Is there something that I aspire to that I can start to bring into the future, into the present and start to connect with? So, you know, I use this example a lot, not that I'm a marathon runner, but people often say like, oh, I've always wanted to be a marathon runner or run marathons. It's something about that, that, you know, energizes me, makes me feel like makes me come alive. And so if that's something you want to be, then you start to think about what are the practices and the things that a marathon runner does and um, how can you embody those things now? And so that is where you start to come into the being of that person. Right. And that is you. Um, it's not just the doing of the marathon runner, but it's also about the essence of who they are. Right, right. Yeah. And then allowing action to emerge from that, right? Exactly. And um, one other thing I often talk, I talk about in the book, but it's, it comes from uh, another uh, really great thought leader is Dan Sullivan's concept of um, the gap in the game. Um, don't be focused so far on the future and what you need to achieve. You know, celebrate the momentum that you create when you start to take those steps um, to, you know, once you've identified who you want to be, start to to make steps in that direction and celebrate the gains that you're getting all along the way. Don't focus on right. how far you need to go because if you're focusing on the future and saying like, Oh, you know, I said I wanted to be, you know, the CEO of this company and I'm only the janitor right now. And I'm no offense to janitors, but like that's, you know, um, that's going to set you up for a lifetime of disappointment. Um, this gap thinking is really a challenging thing. But if you say to yourself, like, you know, have an aspiration and um, I look at like what I've accomplished since I set my goal and it makes me proud of like the things that I'm doing and it's giving me something to celebrate and to, um, to continue to build from. It's a positive mindset. Right, right. And, and then practically speaking, how do you help clients to... <laughs> to stay, well, I don't know if stay in the moment's right word, but stay present to this the 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 achievements that they're experiencing right in this moment as opposed to thinking about the future. 
Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, it's, it's constantly reminding them, like, what are the things that they're, um, that they've done in the past few weeks that have right. been, um, been, you know, that they're learning, that they're, you know, attaching to, that they're, they're feeling good about. And what are the, you know, the, the big part of this is to, to constantly take those small wins and say, how are you applying that into the next week? Um, I, I had this exercise I call it the, uh, the weekly spark, which is, you know, I think it's something that if you're wanting to change any habit, you should have some reflection process where you're able to say, okay, you know, as I look back into the week, the past week, what did I do and how did I, what did I learn? What did I like? What did I not like? And then as I look into the future week, the next week, what am I applying um, into my next week that will, that can be from that last week that I want to apply. You know, how can I do something different? If last week didn't go so well, well, if I'm just going to do the same thing into next week, that's not learning. That's just repeating a pattern. You have to think about how are you disrupting your patterns by thinking, oh, I learned that last week I, I didn't plan enough breaks. And, and I know that if I want to be good and I want to do well and, and, you know, feel good, I need more time for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's, I think something that's so important, isn't it? For anybody seeking mm. a new path is to build in the reflection time. It, it, it's, it seems to me it's a prerequisite for, for transformation. Yeah. 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 Um, and I like this idea of disrupting yourself. I think you had a podcast guest, Whit Whitney Johnson. Is that right? Um, oh yeah. Did, did yeah. she write the book "Disrupt Yourself"? Or um, she sure did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What? So um, yeah. Talk talk to me more about disrupting yourself and what you learned from Whitney. Oh, I mean, Whitney's just a you know powerhouse of of um, insights, and she's brilliant. Um, but Whitney, particularly that book "Disrupt Yourself," is something I I, I use a lot with my clients too because I think it's a uh, it's a great way to think about it. We often have to think about, you know, what is that we are um, getting stuck in and how do we move ourselves out of that, um, you know, that stuck thinking. And that's the only way to grow. As, as Whitney says, you know, growth is our default setting. Um, and so yeah. we have to tap into this fact that we, we, we want to grow, but what often gets in the way of our growth is, is these stuck patterns that we, we have. And I think it's key to, to really challenge ourselves to say, what would disrupt us from that stuck pattern um, and get us thinking differently? And when this whole thing about disruption, which I think is so brilliant, and I talk about it in the book, is this idea that she got it from, um, from Clayton Christensen um, in The Innovator's Dilemma um, way back in the day about this was applied to businesses disruption. And she took the brilliance of like, that idea of disrupting businesses into personal disruption and it and it works so brilliantly um so i love that we, we tap into that a bit right yeah it's uh allowing ourselves to sort of stay to to stay in a bit of confusion to put ourselves deliberately into a space where we're not maybe 100 percent comfortable or to 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 allow for something different to emerge yeah and, and i'll just say um you know just a tapping into this idea that like if you think of yourself as a company, right? We'll just kind of use this concept. This actually comes from uh, another person that I, I mentioned as well, um, Reed Hoffman, who started LinkedIn. He he has a book called The Startup of You, and you know, there's this idea that we are all startups, and we're always having to think, well, where am I taking the company next? How do I ensure my company stays mm -hmm. relevant? Well, we have to disrupt ourselves yeah. to stay relevant, and that. Uh, it's not just about our careers. It has to do with, you know, disrupting ourselves so we can continue to feel energized about our lives. And so I think there's there's a connection there between seeing yourself as a startup and not just a you know uh, a dormant or, you know a big conglomerate company that just continues to just eke along and you know burn you know. Uh, create revenue, but one that is always being nimble and thinking differently and seeing, oh, where's the, where's, where are we going to next? How are we learning and growing? Yeah. And again, I think that, that comes back to reflection, isn't it? It's giving ourselves mm -hmm. time to pause and yeah, mm -hmm. uh, 
new new thoughts to emerge. Um, the other thing which I like to quote from the book, which I made a note of, um, you interviewed Peter Bergman, and he says, if you are willing to feel everything, you can have anything. And certainly in terms of my own journey, learning to feel has yeah. been has been huge for me. But yeah, talk to me more about that idea of, of feeling everything. Yeah, and, and just to, to give Peter some credit, Peter Bregman. Uh, Bregman, so, sorry, not Bergman. I, I, <laughs> that's, my, that's my mild dyslexia kicking in. <laughs> it's okay. It's all good. But yeah, no, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. And you know, I think this is an element of um, the reason why people stay so comfortable in their comfort zone is because they don't, they're afraid of, of being in discomfort. But discomfort is where growth happens. I mean, just this is a great lead on from where we we're talking about Whitney. Um, you know, when I, when I was on my own journey, um, the realization that, you know, I had to get out there in the unknown and be okay with being um, petrified and scared of, of what, where was going to, where was going to go next um, actually allowed me to have a, a deeper sense of, of the emotions that this, um, that I would experience. I mean, Anyone who goes on a, on an entrepreneurial journey is going to be on a roller coaster of emotions. It's never going to be like, oh, this is a this is great, everything's fantastic, and everything's positive, and you know, uh, you know, to borrow from the Lego Movie, um, everything is awesome. It's not everything's awesome every day, and I hope that people don't feel that that's the case for people starting a business. It, it, it it's it's a you know, there's downs, there's ups, there's great experiences along the way, but it also, when you're doing a business like the one that I do, which is really, you know, engaging with people's emotions, you have to be okay with uh, creating space for, you know, dark things to emerge. And um, the more you let that happen, the more you get fortified by realizing that these things are part of the human nature. Right. Yeah. And. As a as a coach, and this is always interesting to me because I, I also work as a coach, um, and you talk about uncovering our past and allowing for feelings to come up. Mm. Where, do you draw a line between you know acting as a coach and acting as a therapist, or do you just see it as as part of sort of part of the same role? You know, I'm interested in how you relate to that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it and here's the thing, and I and um. I'm hopefully not going to offend either therapists or coaches. And this is part of the reason why I don't necessarily just um, call myself a coach. I kind of see myself as an advisor these days because um, coaching is a tool now. I think, it's a bit, I think of it more of as a tool. Mm. Um, it's a great thing to have in your toolbox. And I, and I deploy it very regularly. But um, I also feel like, you know, if I try to be in therapist mode for, um, you know, as a coach, that's a dangerous ground to be in and I'm not going to be there and I'm not a therapist. So the key thing I can do is I want, I want people to see that looking back into their past is, uh, is a great way for us to, to propel ourselves forward. And that might be taboo for some coaches to do because they've been taught that it's a future focus. Yeah. It's a future focus. Um, so I'd rather blend it. I'd rather blend all the tools I have available to me to serve whoever's in front of me. And I think that's what people want most is they want to be able to help be helped. And whatever that might look like, I, I'm very upfront about this to say that, you know, um, I'm going to help you get where you want to go, but it's going to be mixing and blending of many different things. Um, so I yeah. think that's important. Hopefully yeah, that's I think. <laughs> yeah, I love I love that answer, and uh, it makes total sense to me. Um, it, it 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 echoes something I asked a similar question to another somebody who's possibly a bit more on the therapeutic side recently on the podcast, and, and she described now describes herself as a companion. Right? She she doesn't want that. She doesn't. She, yeah, she just doesn't want to have any of the other labels because to to allow herself that freedom to op, to to deal with whatever's emerging. I, I think your answer echoes the same sense. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, now this, uh, this idea that the campfire idea, right. Yes. Uh, which I love, and I didn't realize people have actually done science on being around a campfire, which I found fascinating. 
Um, yeah. But I, I love this that 65% of people feel more connected sharing stories around a campfire, which immediately had me think, well, hang on, there's 35% of people who sit around a campfire and don't feel more connected sharing stories. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to meet those people. But no, nonetheless, so yeah, so I, I'm interested in what you've learned about being around a campfire telling stories and, and uh, yeah, yeah, the insights you've drawn from that. Yeah. Where do I begin? I mean, this is a, I wrote a book because I, because I, I care so deeply about being around campfires. Um, but I think the starting point is this sense of, um, at peace you feel. It's a, it's a grounding experience being around a campfire. You know, you feel as though, um, you don't have any place to be. You're there and you're present. And when people are around, um, in the circle of a campfire, there's a sense of, um, you know, it's safe to get into conversations that are not going to be at the surface. You're not going to talk about, you know, um, the, the surface level conversations when you're in that space. It's almost like you're communing with, um, you know, a lineage of conversations that have happened around campfires since the beginning of time. Um, it almost seems sacred. Uh, and I think that's a cool way to look at it is to say, when we're here, it's, um, it's almost calling us to uh, To have conversations that are going to expand our, you know, hopefully I don't lose you here, but are expanding our consciousness. And that might mean getting to know each other on a deeper level, getting to know each other on a way that allows us to expand what we know of, of our humanity. And I think that's what I wanted to tap into when I started this, uh, the virtual campfire and campfires in general is this thought that like, I want a deeper connection with people. And I think a lot of us do. And the best way for us to tap into that is through um, a, a space that allows people to feel safe and also feel that they're in an intimacy with others. Right. And so is that part of your practice now, t- taking people literally out to, to, to sit around a campfire? Yeah, I have this, um, this program called Campfires of Connection. And what I've done is I've, I've created um, both a real campfire experience and also a, a more of a, you know, an, a campfire experience without fire that can go inside of an organization so that people don't have to feel like, okay, we're going to have some fire hazards here. So, um, so I do that um, experience as well. So. Right. And uh, well, I'm, so now I'm intrigued. Then. So you te- do, you, do you have something to symbolize the, the fire do you have well, how does that work yeah i mean we sit we sit in the round uh we create a, a center piece that that basically is meant this is the fire and so that you know we don't have marshmallows but i think that's an idea that i potentially will um have to bring in just for fun um but the idea is to create that um the environment make it as warm as possible to get people to feel um you know that sense of we're in a fire a campfire um round and um, break down the barriers. You know, one of the things that I, I want to tap into here, just so you know, is that like people might say, like, oh, well, we we have conversations all the time during our Zoom meetings, and when we come together, we have conversations. But this is a very intentional space, and I think the key thing is that you need, if you want people to connect more deeply, you have to be very intentional about that. You can't just right. kind of like tack this on to the end of a meeting or to, um, to just create it on the spot from any random thing. You have to be very intentional about creating that container. Right. And so you, you'll go in, you'll have people sit around the, 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 the centerpiece if it's, in, if it's mm. inside an office. And what, do, what then unfolds? What do people do? Well, they'll share um, parts of who they are and um, things that they... Um, you know, their past, parts of their past that they probably never shared with each other. I mean, there is a, a part of this, which I mentioned in my TED talk, um, it's called Don't Check Yourself at the Door, which is to say that we we don't really bring all our full selves into the work because there's a fear that it might hold us back. But the reality is we need to, we need to bring our full selves. And if we want to build trust, we want to be innovative. Um, connection is the path to doing that. And by getting to know 
our past stories, getting to know our hobbies, our interests outside of work, it, it creates something in us that um, makes us want to do more for each other, makes us want to, um, to celebrate and honor and support each other on a deeper level. And you might say, oh, that's, this is work. Who cares? Well, I care. I mean, I think the people who are in the workplace would care because they're spending a lot of time together. Mm. Um, even if it's just, it's just virtual, you want to get to know people because th- these are people you're spending most of your working days, your, your waking hours with. Mm. Wouldn't you want to feel as though that a good portion of your life is spent with people you care about? Yeah. 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 That, that, that makes sense. And I've also got in the back of my mind, a, a, an entrepreneur I had on the podcast just a few episodes back, who was making precisely the opposite argument and saying we shouldn't bring our full selves into the work. And he was, he was suggesting that the, the problem with bringing our full selves into work is that we, we've lost this, this barrier between our private lives and our personal lives. And actually it can, it can degrade mental health because we're, 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 we're never making that distinction and never sort of switching off. Yeah, what, mm. what would you say to that? Well, and, and he's, he's right to an extent, because I think there's, you know, one of the other things I talk about is making sure you also have um, a life outside of work. Uh, and I don't mm. that doesn't mean that, like, you know, um, you don't bring yourself into the work. You should. But you should also have, you know, groups. And I, I had this idea of what's your third space? Like, what is the space you're creating? If you're um, married and. Um, your, you know, your, your partner is the only one that you are in, in contact with. You need to figure out how am I creating friends as an adult? Because right. it, it is hard. Um, it, when we start to get into these worlds where work and family are the only things that we see, we've got to figure out, like, how do we create a third place for us to connect with others? Um, and so I think that is important. And I think the best way to, to tap into that is to explore what are the hobbies that I've left behind? What are the things that I've never, um, the threads that I haven't pulled in a long time in terms of, you know, the areas of my life that I haven't allowed to, to flourish. So mm-hmm. yeah, he's right, but not right in the sense that um, it's still a great, an area where you're going to spend a lot of time. Why not at least open the aperture and, um, and share more of you? It doesn't mean you have to share like all of your intimate details of your love life or, I mean, there's, there's authenticity and sharing, but there's also a limit. Right. You know um, I mean, how about politics, right? Cause what I think one of the, the, the sources of his thesis yeah. that we shouldn't bring our whole was, you know, imagine oh, in the UK context, it would be somebody who's very pro Brexit and someone's a Remainer and you put them together on a team and they're openly sharing their political views. Yeah. You can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, I love that you bring this up because it's exactly what I mean. It's like there is a limit to there's a um, there's a certain amount of authenticity that you bring into the space, and it and it has to. There's a few things I think of when I think about that. When you're sharing, it's about is this a, uh, this sharing going to offend, alienate, um, or potentially drive someone away by what I share? Now that doesn't mean that you know sharing with somebody saying like, hey, you know. Um, in my, when I was growing up, I was, I was born, you know, in, um, you know, during the Holocaust. I mean, there, it could be something like that. And just people knowing that hey, this person's been through a lot, has, has dealt with a lot of struggle or knowing that, you know, you grew up in a family that was, um, I don't know, poor growing up. And now you've, uh, you've come a long way and you've, and you feel very proud of that. And you want to share that. That's an interesting fact or a thing that you want to do. Or, you know, some of the hobbies you do now, those are things that are not going to alienate. They might draw people in to be curious, to want right. to know more. But if you're saying that you're, you know, you're pro-gun, you know, pro-vax, or whatever it may be, uh, that doesn't really help. Right. It doesn't, that it doesn't just, let them so much into your, yeah, your world. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, you know, it, it's, you got to be careful about what you're sharing. And that's why I think the first step in doing this type of work is first connect with yourself. And then this is what I say about in the book is this idea that like, we have to connect with ourselves first before we can connect with others. Who am I and what do I want to be? And what, what part of me do I want to 
really explore first so that I can be sure that I'm sharing the parts that I really care about most. Right. Which is interesting. And this comes back to your point about creating intentional spaces and being very explicit about that. And I suppose that that applies not just to the campfire, but to the, you yeah. know, the organization as a whole, right? It, it, make that an intentional space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. C- create, create clarity about what, what this space on, on the other side of the boundaries looks like and, you know, how we want people to share and show up. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've picked out a couple of the highlights that I had from, from the book, uh, the, the campfire lessons for leaders. Um, are there any that you'd particularly like to share given where we're at the conversation, you know, somebody particularly inspired you? I mean, I know there are dozens of stories in there, but. There really are. Um, and I think I would maybe touch on, um, I think it's the last chapter. I, guess. <laughs> I wrote this book, but I can't remember all the chapters. Um, last chapter is about not going in alone. And I think that's an important part of this. We often think of, you know, these journeys we go on as being a solo endeavor. But, um, you know, I highlight a few entrepreneurs who have found their, their yin to their yang and have found um, their, the, the people who help them to really unlock the secret to their success. Uh, and I love that. Uh, and I love seeing that through the stories that they shared, but also realizing that sometimes we think we are on this journey alone and we have to be the, the, um, the person who perseveres. We have to find people who can help us whether it be a mentor, coaches, anyone who's on the journey with you who can just uh, give you the encouragement that you need um, and champion you as you're going through the darkest of moments. Yeah. Yeah. I have to, that, that totally resonates, you know, with mm-hmm. me. I think I'm very fortunate with, you know, the mentors and the people I found when I've reached out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, your third space to come all the way back to your initial artistic pursuits. Uh, yeah, I'm now curious if if you created your own third third space and, and picked up some some of those uh, lost threads. I have actually, um, I, it, and I would say that I'd like to do more of it. But I um, I do some glass blowing, which is really uh, something I absolutely love doing. There's something about glass that has um, that hits a nerve for me because as it, you create it, you shape it. It's got a lot of like uh, fragility to it, and you never know quite what you're going to get until it's finished. Have um, you got anything there you could show me? Not right here, I no. Know, but I, I, I do have some stuff in the house. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and uh, and the people I've met through it are really cool. Um, and uh, just yeah, it's something that really intrigues me. So mm. brilliant, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I see it so much um, mm. as a as a, as a recommended, uh, you know, activity to, to touch into ourselves and who we are and, and develop our own authenticity in life is to actively engage in the arts and get creative consciously. It makes yeah. sense. And I'm always trying to try different things. I mean, I've actually been, um, I've done some pottery work, uh, just anything with my hands. You know, one of the things that often happens is we spend a lot of time on computers, which yeah. is great because the technology helps us, but Anything that gets me, um, you know, using my, uh, my hands, whether it be, you know, working with metals, doing things with um, anything creative, it's fun, you know, it's kind of mm. nice to get out and experience something different. Brilliant. I love that. Fantastic. Uh, well, I mean, this has been an awesome conversation. I've, I've really appreciated it. Any, anything we haven't touched on that you'd, you'd like to, sh- to share? No, but I, I will just, you know, add one last, you know, thing I'll, I'll share with most people is to say, if you feel like you're, you know, not, there's something missing, um, the gateway to anything changing is through conversation. So, yeah, you know, think about people who uh, you haven't talked to in a while. I mean, one of the things that I've been on a journey this year is, is reconnecting with people I haven't talked to in a while and having conversations that, you know, you never know what that could open up. So, yeah, brilliant. Okay. And so for people who want to connect with you, uh, you know, engage with you, it's ipurposepartners.com. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. I, I as in 
little I. Uh, yes. I purpose, not I as in. Yes. Um, Ipurposepartners.com. Uh, anywhere else you'd said, and then we'll put links to to the to the two books that I mentioned, uh, the Campfire mm-hmm. Lessons and Climbing the Rat Mountain. Uh, anywhere else you might want to send people? Well, another great place to find me is on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active right. there. Always sharing new content and what have you. But yeah, feel free to reach out there. Excellent. All right. Well, Tony, this has been fantastic. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Can't wait. Well, this one is live, but then we we also create a, a kind of a, a slightly cleaned up version as well that we put out onto the audio platform. So can't wait to get it out there. Same here. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tony. Cheers. <laughs>